Welcome to the Grace City Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. If we can help you in any way, feel free to reach out to hello at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. So I'm going to read our text to get us started today, and then we're going to go through and we're going to want to see what God wants to speak to us through this. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to be reading out of the NASB today. Yeah, oh, okay. And so what happens, you take a few seminary classes and your pastor starts reading out of the NASB. But we're going to be in Romans 5, 15 through 21. And I'm going to read this, then we'll pray and jump in. So, but the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many God, much more to the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For it, by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as the one transgression then resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as though the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks to us today in our circumstances, in our situations that we're dealing with. Your word is alive and it ministers to us. God, we thank you for the way in which you communicate to us through your word and through prayer. Father, would your Holy Spirit speak to us today? Would these words be from you and not from me? Would you use this time to open up our eyes and open up our hearts to you and your grace? We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this past May of 2019, so just this last year, there's a powerful story that I didn't want to to escape our attention. There were students at Morehouse, a college in Atlanta, you may have heard of it, that were greatly surprised at their commencement speech. You know, every year, different like colleges, somewhere between May and June, have these special speakers that come in. There's always this anticipation of like, oh, who's our speaker gonna be? And then what are they gonna say? I remember when I was a campus minister up in Oregon State, I believe it was Michelle Obama who was one of the speakers. That's a big deal for Corvallis. That's what happens when you hire her brother as a basketball coach. You get her for a commencement speech, right? It was a package deal. But there's always this anticipation around not just finishing school in the commencement, but <clears throat> Who will be that speaker? And here at Morehouse this year, billionaire Robert F. Smith was given the opportunity to address the class of 2019. And during his speech, he committed to make a donation to pay off the entire class of 2019's debt. It's like, man, I went to the wrong school. That came out to millions of dollars and it covered about 400 students. 400 students. Could you imagine what it would felt like if like, you were there in that crowd and be like, is this, is this a joke, or can I get excited, or like, what? you wouldn't know what to do, right? Because this, this gift is just so extreme and unbelievable, you wouldn't know what to do. Think about the, the student that had to take an extra, like, semester to graduate, or went through hardships and racked up even more debt than they had planned, and then they thought they would ever be able to pay off, and they limp through graduation, and then it's like, hey, I got this for you. Like, imagine the emotions that were in that room. I mean, I've been paying off student loans for well over a decade. I'm like, man, I couldn't imagine being in that room. Now, this man's worth $5 billion or so, and so he had the ability to do that. He had the ability to do this. What a great gospel illustration. Like, think about this. We all have a debt that we're unable to pay. If the gospel doesn't make you get excited in the same way that these students' debt being forgiven does, then we are missing something. We're missing 
So, because in the same way as these students at Morehouse, they had a debt that many of them was probably ominous, and they didn't know, how am I ever going to pay this? What am I going to do? I'm going to be out here work three jobs just to pay the minimum thing, like monthly payments on these things, right? Like, what am I going to do? I have this debt that seems unpayable. How am I going to cope with this? And like they were feeling in that, man has this debt inherently because of sin that we can't pay on our own, that just looms over us. But through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, that debt is paid. It's a gift. It's a gr gift of grace that if we can think about and put ourselves into the space of, oh my gosh, to have my debt paid from school by this five billion dollar guy, right? He's worth five billion. Like, how excited would I be? We should be able to get how much more excited because of the gift that was given to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is a gospel illustration. But in order for someone else to pay that debt off, they had to be both willing and capable to do it. Now, if I walked in, I was like, hey, y'all, I'm a pastor. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay off all your student debt. What do you think? <laughs> uh, 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 okay. Like, I may be willing, but I'm not capable of doing that. If, if you guys want proof, I can give that after service. But, like, not all of us are capable of blessing those people in that way. But the one who is both willing and capable to pay off that debt that we have because of sin and that condition in this world is Jesus. And we're going to look through and further, further understand what this gift of grace, what God's grace actually means to us. Because it's really easy for us to think about a credit card or a mortgage or student loans being paid off because that's something tangible that we have experienced. But oftentimes... In the busyness of life and in the reality of our circumstances and our busyness, we fail to realize the price that was paid for us by Christ. That God gave his son to pay a cost much higher than these student debts. And, and we have a tough time getting excited about that because it just seems kind of distant and intangible. And so over these next weeks, my goal is that we can feel the full weight of the debt that we owed so we can feel the full weight of the price that was paid and the celebration that is due because of that. And that's called the gospel. My hope is that as a church, we will have a firm grasp on what the gospel means for us and what it means for everybody that has not yet come into these walls or the walls of a Jesus-following church in our area. But that will be something that we will know. We will know what we owed, what we were given, and what that means for every person that we interact with. Amen? Amen. And so this isn't just a series to further define a word in the Bible. This is a series to define the understandings of our heart so that that will pour out and overflow into our relationships and the way in which we care about the people in our lives. So like I mentioned earlier, many times we use words that we're familiar with, but we're unclear on the definition. I'm sure if we sat here for a couple minutes and I put a whiteboard up and we did a nice brainstorming session, we could think of plenty of words. See, Corey, the teacher, was like, yeah, let's do it. We could think of plenty of words that like, oh yeah, I hear that word a lot, but there might be 10 different definitions of that word in this room. You, got, you guys feel me there? You kind of, we have these words, right? Where they're familiar, but we don't necessarily understand fully what it means. And I believe grace is one of those words. Many understand grace is a thing that we do before eating a meal. It's the thing we do, oh, let's say grace, right? Like, that can be the extent of it in some places. And others of us may understand grace simply as us wanting people to cut us a break when we do something wrong or when we fail at something. Come on, man, give me some grace. I didn't mean to. I didn't intend to do that. Give me some grace. Give me another chance. I mean, it's just minimized to something we say before a meal or when we want someone to cut us a break because we screwed up. That is not grace, not the kind of grace we are talking about. What does Paul mean in this text when he's using the word grace? He means that which is given freely and generously. That which is given freely and generously. And to better understand grace and the nature of this generous gift, Paul uses two stories that serve as a backdrop for this text today. One is the story of Adam in Genesis 3, the original transgression, as it's referred to in here. And then one, the other is Christ dying on the cross, where it's in the scripture it said the one, and the one was capitalized. But why is that capitalized? Because it's referring to Jesus, right? He lays these two stories as the backdrop for this scripture. In Genesis 3, we see the story of the fall. The serpent tempts Eve into disobeying God's command, and she eats the forbidden fruit. She later gives it to Adam, and then he ate it. 
as well, and the effects of sin fell upon humanity at that point in time. We're, pr we're pretty familiar with this story, it's referred to as the fall. And the relationship between God and his creation fractured when they fell into sin and all humanity fell with them. This relationship, this meaningful, life-giving relationship was fractured. And there was a chasm placed in between humanity and their creator. And all of us have not only been affected by the sin of Adam, but we've also been infected by it. It's something that finds its way into our lives. We know this because we follow the pattern of Adam when we live out of disobedience to God. When we live out of disobedience to God, we know that we're infected by that condition of sin. It's found its way into our lives. Romans 5.12, just before the scripture we read, says, Therefore, just as, though, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spreads to all men, because all sin. Now there's a word used over and over in our passage today to describe this act of obedience from Adam. And it was transgression. You guys heard that a few times, right? Transgression. In the Greek, it's paraptoma. And it literally means fallen down from being beside. Fallen down from being beside. So think about that. Mankind was walking beside their creator, beside God in the garden. But because of their transgression, that was fractured. Well, and that, if we think about that in the light of the original meaning, like to falling down from being beside. It's not just like, you offended me, you upset me, I hope you get in trouble, you're going to jail. No, it's you were once beside. Like imagine being in the garden being with beside your creator, your heavenly father, void of all the things that stain the images of parents and fathers and relationships that we have these days. It was perfect. They were beside him in the garden, and this transgression caused them to fall from being beside, to fall away from them. You could say this means to fall away after being close beside. And for me, that imagery just helps it come to life. It helps it come to life. Instead of like, oh, God's really sensitive and he was offended by them eating the apple. They didn't listen to him. Because I, I've done enough evangelism. I've heard people say, like, why is God so sensitive? Like, I, I think you're missing the point. They were once walking beside one another in the garden in this perfect relationship. And man decided they wanted to govern themselves, rule their own lives apart from God. And they fell away from being beside him. He fell away. This idea of transgression goes beyond merely missing the mark. It was personal to God. He created humans to be in relationship with him, and now they've fallen from being beside him. What makes sin so sinful is not just what we do, but who we do it to. It's not just the action. It's the relationship that is fractured because of it. And we need to understand that to fully grasp, ultimately, the grace that's extended to us. We need to understand the implications of sin. Now, this word transgression comes up several times in our passage. When we read in verse 15, the free gift is not like the transgression. As much as this passage highlights the impact of Adam's transgression, this passage much more emphasizes the impact of Jesus' act of obedience that lead, results in grace. And it's only in understanding the depth of our transgression that we can understand the full joy in Jesus' death and resurrection and that bringing us back into right relationship with God. I once heard it said that if we had a small view of our sin, we will have a small view of our salvation. If we don't know the price that was to be paid, we can't fully appreciate the tab that was covered because of Jesus, the gift that we were given. If we have a small view of our sin, we will have a small view of our salvation. And Paul begins to contrast the free gift of grace of Jesus with the transgression of Adam in the scripture. So what does this mean for us? There's a lot of big words in there, a lot of things that maybe you haven't heard before. It's kind of going back and forth circling and it can be hard to follow. What does it mean for us? Adam's sin messed up our relationship with God very basic level. Messed up our relationship with God. The result is death, judgment, and condemnation. Now these are words that refer to more like a sentencing in court, right? Like 
banging the gavel. This is your sentence. Like, let it, let it be. Um, but our feelings of guilt towards God is not just a feeling in our consciousness that's caused from bad thinking. It's really caused by sin. Sin is at the root of all of this stuff. And something had to be done concerning these transgressions. There had to be something done to free us from the status that we had. <clears throat> However, God's grace transforms our relationship with God. The gift that he gave, the price that he paid. And it's important to note that this gift, this grace may be freely given, but it's not cheap. It wasn't just something that said, you know what, I'm going to give you a pass this time. Oftentimes when I've been on campus talking to people about, uh, about Jesus and sin and the price that was paid for them, like, why, why does that have to be such a big deal to God? Why can't he just say, okay, well, give me another try? But if we really, like, sit down and ask ourselves, is just giving us another try going to change the roots of sin that's in our lives? Nope. Or do we need a transformed heart? Do we need to live under the power of the Holy Spirit that can actually help us to live that way? This isn't about managing our morals and getting a little spanking on the rear and moving on and not making that same decision again. This is about a transformed heart, a change of a way of life where we give our lives, surrender them to the way that Jesus calls us to live. And we can do that because of his grace that was extended for us. This is the gospel. This is the gospel message. For those of you that may not have heard what the gospel is in a clear and concise way, here's, here's a way that we can, we can even commit it to memory. The gospel is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving he is the Son of God and offering the gift of salvation and forgiveness of sins to anyone, say anyone, anyone who repents and believes in him. This is the message that we've been given a stewardship to share. Not because it's an assignment, but because it's, it's a mission that we've experienced the transformation of. And how can we not share something that transforms us from the inside out? If you've experienced this gospel working in your life, transforming your soul, how can you not share that? And I know I, like, toot this horn so often in our Sunday messages, like, you guys, you've experienced this. You know this. It has impacted your life. How can we not share that? And there's illustration after illustration that we could give. But at the core, if we don't understand the root of our depravity and sin, we don't understand the priciness that was, of that gift that was given to us. If we continue to look at our sin as small, we will see our salvation as small. When we understand that sin caused a chasm between us and our Creator, we can more understand and be filled with joy for the gift and the grace that was given to us. We have to understand one to understand the other. Here's what I want us to learn and I think we can learn from our passage today. First of all, God's grace is greater than what we have done. It's greater than what we have done. I know a lot of your stories in this room, and I know that I've wrestled through this as well. We're just like, yeah, that's great for everybody else in here, but I, I'm pretty screwed up. You don't know what I've done. You don't know about what my life looked like 10 years ago. This grace thing, yeah, that sounds great for all you nice people, but I'm really not one of those people. I believe some of you in here can relate to maybe having thoughts or feelings that way about your life and what you've done or what you've been through, even what's been done to you and you don't feel worthy to accept that gift. Verse 15 says, How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Not that it was just contained into one community or to one family or one people group, but it overflowed to many. This gift of grace is for everybody. If you feel unworthy, if you feel like you've messed up too much or you're too far, it's especially for you. The question is, will you receive it? Because the debt has somebody that's willing and able to pay it. There's somebody there, willing and able, like this billionaire, this graduation. He's willing and able to pay it. Will you receive it? Will you receive it? 
We don't move forward with God by minimizing our sin, but rather by maximizing His grace. When we actually are confronted with the reality of our messiness and our sin, we get an opportunity to maximize the grace and the goodness of God in those moments. We don't have to minimize like, what we've done so that the punishment is less. That's already been taken care of. Just come to God with the reality of who you are, where you've been, what you've done, your feelings of unworthiness, your feelings of guilt and shame, and hand those to him and let his grace be maximized in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you do that? It's not that sin isn't that big of a deal, but God's grace is greater than what you have done. That's the first point I want us to take. Second, God's grace is greater than we deserve. It's greater than we deserve. 16 says, The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. We are no longer condemned by sin. We are not only spared to do what we deserve, or spared to do what we deserve, but we receive the grace we do not deserve. Later in Romans 8, 1, we're actually told that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you are in Jesus, that sin has been dealt with. There is no longer any condemnation in that. And God is greater than what you may have deserved before he paid that steep price for your life, for your heart, your soul. He's greater. And finally, God's grace is greater than what we fear. Anybody have some fears in here? A bit. Am I the only one? I got a couple. Doc's got a couple. <laughs> God's grace is greater than our fears. Verse 17 says, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? For many people, for many of us, the greatest fear we deal with is death. For many people, that's just like, what's your greatest fear? Oh, dying. And often there's some means of that death that accompanies our nightmares, right? Like, I'm this, or I'm scared of dying from this, or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to make you stumble. But it, the, there's a fear of this in, in our world. Like, we're just, we're scared of death and what might happen. But as we saw in Romans 5, 12, death entered through sin. And now later in verse 17, we see that the result is that death reigned through one man. However, because the gift of God, we can now reign in this life. Later in verses 20 through 21, it says, So also grace, grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace is greater than our fears. He's greater than the fear of death or the fear of the unknown or the fear of what we are going to do, what our life is going to look like, our five-year plan, our ten-year plan, what's going to happen with our kids, all these things that we get anxious about and are fearful of. God is in control and His grace is greater than all of those things. Amen? Amen? So when we go back to that story, of this billionaire showing up to graduation and saying, like, hey, I got this. Send me your bills. I'm going to cover your, your student loan debt. When the students received the news about their tuition being paid, they celebrated like it had already happened. There hadn't been a single transaction. They hadn't given the bills. They didn't go the hurry and check the tab on their mobile app and say, oh, I don't know. It hasn't been done yet. It's not completed yet. I'm just going to go ahead and be skeptical about this. They did not have to see their account because they trusted what was spoken. Because he had the means, he was capable, and he was willing. And God's grace is freely given as a gift due to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. However, like any gift, we must receive it in faith. And today, in this next week, in these next years, it is not likely that you will see the fullness of this gift of grace manifested in your life. You'll see pieces of it. You'll see moments of it. You'll see him working through you. You'll see the evidence of it through your soul being transformed and through others being transformed by it as well. But until Jesus returns, we don't get to see the fullness of this debt that was paid. But we are called to walk it out in faith without just continuously checking the balance and seeing that there's evidence of that debt being paid. We're called to walk it out in faith. How do we know it's been done? Because God said it has been. 
And for some of us, that can be challenging because we have trust issues in our life. Anybody that has trust issues in their life like me? You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, like, we struggle to trust people to do what they say they're going to do, right? Yep. And so this can be a challenging thing. Like, well, yeah, you got you. Clearly, you say that. But I haven't seen the fullness of that manifested in my life or in others yet. So, so what gives? How am I supposed to walk out in faith and believe that's going to happen? And many times in the Bible, when people are questioning and wondering about the heart and character of God, he tells them, remember. Remember what I've done for you. Remember that I love you. Remember when I parted the sea. Remember when manna rained down from heaven because you were hungry. Remember when you were complaining because you wanted meat and you were sick of manna and you had quail for days. Remember what I have done for you. Remember. So when you doubt and you're struggling with the faith to walk out knowing that God has given you this abundant, amazing gift of grace, I simply ask you, remember. Remember what he's done. Remember the people that you've been given to walk through life with. Remember the ways in which he's provided for you in times of need. Remember the community he's given you, the family he's given you. Even in all their quirks and imperfections, there's still a gift from God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Remember what he has done and know that it is his character and his identity to continue to do those things. We may not understand it. We may not get every detail of why he does what he does, but we can fully trust him. Because his grace is greater than all our fears, all our past, and greater than what we deserve. Because Jesus paid that price on the cross. He is the one that paid the price for those transgressions. And I am so grateful for that. And it's my prayer that as we step into this year, not only that we will fully understand the gift of God's grace in our lives, but we will understand what that is meant to propel us into. You see, this grace that God gives us is not just meant to be something that's head knowledge. It's not just meant to be something like, oh, I understand that. Great, I can file that away. I now have that information. Great. It is meant to compel us into caring and contending for others. It's meant to activate compassion and mission and, and like just caring about other people and just ourselves as we walk through our daily lives. It is meant to do something, to activate something in us. And I pray that we will be a church that's known for understanding the price that was paid for us, and that that would activate us to share that with others. I can't think of a better way to honor God and serve Him in this community as we walk into this year. I really can't. I think that's our mission. I think that's our calling. I think that's the stewardship that God's given us in this year. And I believe that as we walk that out, as we allow our lives to be courageously activated in that way, even over our fears and insecurities, God will be glorified, and the face of this city and this county will be changed. Amen? Amen. It just takes a faithful remnant to step out and step forward, activated by the transformation that we've experienced, to see what God might do through us. If you're like me, you're keenly aware of all the reasons why you shouldn't be that person. And my prayer is that you will realize that it's not out of your own merits or out of your own doing, but it's out of Christ in you that you get to engage in this mission. It's not about your resume. It's not about you being perfect. It's about you being obedient, trusting your heavenly Father, and understanding the price that's been paid for you so that you can extend that good news to others. Amen? Hallelujah.